grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, let's take a look at verses 16 and 17 of our gospel lesson. It said, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. That is, he invited many people. And he sent his servant at supper time to say that to say to them that were bidden, Come. For all things are now ready. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about God's preparation and bringing to pass the kingdom of God, everlasting life, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal salvation. And he speaks of it as a great supper because he himself is sitting at a supper table at a big dinner that was given by his opponents who were watching him to see if they could catch him slipping up at something. So he describes the kingdom of God as a great supper to which many are invited. Now, the supper is great for a number of reasons. Number one, because of who prepared the supper. God. All right? This is God's work and God's gift. And therefore, it is great, surpassingly great. It is also great because of what is served at this supper. In the kingdom of God, that which is given to those who come is the full forgiveness of all their sins, acceptance with God in fellowship, table fellowship, all the grace and gifts of God that are given to us in the gospel and in the sacraments, Jesus Christ himself who comes to us and gives us eternal life. And that's what makes it a great supper because of the greatness of what is served at this supper. The supper is also great because of its utter uniqueness. What you receive in the kingdom of Christ you can get nowhere else, no other human institution, no philosophy, no outlook on life can give you the things which Jesus gives you in the kingdom of grace and in the coming kingdom of glory. And so it is indeed a great suffering. A supper given by God, a supper which gives eternal salvation in all of its ramifications, and a supper that we can get nowhere else than at the hand of Jesus. When he says in this text, come, for all things are now ready, he refers both to the promises of the Old Testament when God sent out the initial invitations, and then to the finished work of Christ. Because Jesus obeyed God's law on our behalf, and because he paid the penalty in his own body for our sins, our eternal salvation is an accomplished fact and reality. Everything that we receive is finished, given, and received in the grace of God. We're not building anything. We're not contributing anything. We are the receivers of the finished work of Christ. And that, my friends, 
is wonderful news that God is not calling us to put our best foot forward and to give it the old college try, but rather the Lord is calling us to receive all the benefits that have been purchased and won for us in Christ. Now in verse 18 to 20, they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So here, in this part of our lesson, we learn that most people to whom the invitation comes, most people who hear the preaching of the gospel, most people who are promised the gift of everlasting life, by their own fault, they refuse to receive it. They despise the gospel and they prefer the things of this world. And so, whatever the excuses that people make in their lives, the reasons why they put off the preaching of the gospel, they put up the stop sign in front of the preacher, and they will not, they will not have all the bounty of the kingdom of God. They do so by their own fault, and they miss out on the one thing needful that they can receive no place else. Now the servant comes, and he reports this to the householder. He reports this to the Lord. It says, in, uh, then the servant came and showed his Lord all these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said unto his servants. Now let's just stop there for a second. The unbelief of those who will not receive the gospel, it arouses the wrath and displeasure of God. All right? You do not reject the gospel with impunity, right? The gospel is to be believed. It is to be received. Those who, for whatever excuse, whatever reason, say no to the preaching of the gospel, such people arouse the wrath of God by their persistence in unbelief. At the end of our parable, it says in verse 24, I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so it is here, none of those who were bidden shall taste of my supper. Instead of receiving it with faith and being baptized, they pushed it away from themselves and they will not taste of the Lord so long as they remain in impenitence and unbelief. But the last thing in our text today, so let's just review Number one, 
The Great Supper is the gospel. It is the kingdom of God in Christ. It is great because of who gives it. It is great because of what is served, and it is great because of its uniqueness. But most people who hear the gospel despise the gospel, despise Christ, and prefer their own way. This, their excuses, arouse the wrath of God, and none of them will taste the supper of the Lord. And now we come to the last part. In the last part today, the kingdom and salvation of God in Christ comes nevertheless. All right? The unbelief of the many does not cancel out the truth of the gospel. And so here, though they despise it, though they will not have it, the gospel comes and it does its work. It says here in our text that the master said, go out into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Bring in whoever will come in regardless of their status and their condition. Go out and bring people in. Now, Jesus mentions the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind because those were the people that in his society were considered to be worthless people. Right? They were considered to be worthless. Their, their condition was obviously a sign of God's displeasure with them. And so, uh, so everyone looked down upon the poor, upon the main, upon the halt, and upon the blind. Right? But these are the ones who are invited to come into the supper and to fill the master's house. And they come. And they come as people who never dream that they would be a part of such a wonderful thing in their lives. They come as people who have struck gold. They have come as people who can't believe how fortunate they are to be in a situation where they get to enjoy something they never thought they would enjoy in their lives. You see, and that's the nature of Christian faith. Christian faith receives the gift and rejoices in the gift and is thankful to be included by the grace of God. So the master, the ser servant comes in and he says to the master, it is done as you said, and yet there's still room. There's more room. And the master says, Go out into the highways and into the hedges and compel them to come in. Earnestly urge people from every walk of life, from all over the world, from hither and yon. Compel them to come in. Urge them strenuously. Preach the law in all of its fullness and preach the gospel in all of its sweetness. Compel them to come in and uh, that my house may be filled. Listen, the kingdom of God has come in Jesus Christ. The gospel is God's invitation to everyone to come and to benefit from this wonderful reality. Many people despise it and refuse it. But thanks be to God, the gospel is still the gospel nevertheless. And we get to rejoice in the fact that it has come even to us. Amen.
peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus.